Uh, good morning. Um, thanks a lot for the opportunity to present today. I'm, I'm going to be talking about some alternatives to, uh, to what Dr. Chair just talked about. Um, obviously, endovascular uh, therapy has really uh, replaced a lot of the open operations that we've done to a large degree, but there's certainly a, a continued role for, for many of these operations, in fact, all of these operations in certain settings. Um, the, I'm going to kind of go over some of the same things he did. The, the first thing, uh, and the reason for that is it's important to focus on indications um, indications for an operation, obviously. There's, with percutaneous interventions, it's very easy to, to kind of bring someone to the cath lab and start, start tampering with their vessels, but we need to remember there are certain indications for doing what we do, and that's true whether it's open or percutaneous interventions. So the first thing to really focus on is, is the, the, uh, the, the presentation. There's a very big difference between claudicants and the CLI patients or critical limb ischemia patients. Um, claudication generally results from uh, arterial disease at a single level. It can be multi-level, but it's often single level or at least one level is causing the problem. Um, it's almost never due to tibial disease. I say almost never because there are certain situations in which patients can have symptoms from trifurcation disease, but, but really this is mostly femoral popliteal disease or aortoiliac disease. Um, and it results from increased oxygen demand by the calf muscles when exercising that cannot be met because of the, uh, the disease within the, uh, the arterial bed. Uh, it's important to note that although this impacts quality of life and um, produces disability and can affect the patient's level of, of function and activity, um, many patients will improve with an exercise program alone. So that's the appropriate first therapy for all patients with claudication. Uh, it's also important to recognize that only 5% of patients will progress to limb loss over time. That's very different than patients with critical limb ischemia, which often results from multi-level disease. Um, and basically, in a critical limb state, the patient has inadequate uh, perfusion for basic resting uh, metabolic needs, uh, meta basic tissue metabolic needs. And so the rest pain that patients in rest pain get is from nerve ischemia, um, whereas the tissue loss, ulceration, gangrene uh, you see in later stages is due to ischemia to the, to the rest of the tissues. Um, it's also important to know that, if, that over 50 percent of these patients will go on to lose their affected limb if you don't intervene. So there's good justification for treating these patients. Um, so, you know, in, in, uh, again, to highlight the indication, whether it's a patient with claudication or, or critical limb ischemia, the urgency and even the necessity of whether or not we do anything for the patient depends on that presentation, as well as some of the other issues such as the patient's comorbidities, functional status, and maybe the amenability to percutaneous intervention. For example, if you have a 90-year-old patient with a small co-ulcer that's dry gangrene, this is someone you could probably safely follow rather than putting them through a bypass under general anesthesia. On the other hand, if they have a short SFA occlusion, this may be something that is worth going after to, to try to improve the chance that they'll heal this somewhat stable um, situation despite the fact that it's CLI. Um, so, the, you know, an important question is whether it's necessary to treat intermittent claudication. Um, I already highlighted the fact that symptoms remain unchanged or improved in 50 to 75 percent of patients. Uh, symptoms worsen in about 25 percent of patients. Um, a very low percentage of these patients will require an amputation. Um, that said, some will progress to critical limb ischemia and you can intervene upon them then. So the, the, the simple answer to do you have to treat this, I would say no. You can manage these patients conservatively by moder um, modifying the risk factors and, and um, assessing, um, assessing them periodically and, and trying to see if you can you know, push them along with an exercise program, smoking cessation, et cetera. Um, that said, these patients do have an increased risk of mortality from cardiovascular diseases. About 20% will suffer an MI or stroke or some other non-fatal um, cardiovascular event. And there's about a 30% five-year mortality for these patients. Um, so it's, uh, so it's, it's, it's tempting to think that we can maybe affect, affect their mortality and their functional uh, status can be related to mortality. And that's possible, but that's really never been, been shown. So despite the fact that functional status is, in, is impaired, um, there's, there's often a gradual pattern of decline of these patients' level of activity, um, and this can be detrimental to all aspects of their quality of life um, and, and really, you know, affect their day-to-day -day living. It's not clear whether by improving the claudication we can affect some of these other mortality-related issues. Um, uh, the, um, the, the truth is this is very different with CLI. These patients will have high amputation rates without intervention, so most of these patients warrant an intervention. And the, the other truth about CLI patients is those patients who go on to have an amputation have a higher mortality in general. So if we can do something to affect the amputation rate in these patients, we can, we'd probably affect their mortality, which is not clear so much in claudication. So the goals of treatment claudication are listed here. Relieve ex exertional symptoms, improve walking capacity, and generally we want to improve their quality of life. Uh, it's less clear whether we can affect any of the other, uh, cardiovascular events in, these, in this group. Whereas the goals of treatment of CLI patients is to really to relieve rest pain, maintain their current quality of life, avoid the uh, amputation and the mortality, the increased mortality that goes with amputation. 
Um, we're all familiar with the task guidelines. I won't go over this in too much detail. Um, uh, other than say there's, there are uh, revised task classifications for both aorta iliac disease and infrainguinal disease. And these guidelines um, were basically guidelines for the, that help you decide whether to proceed with an open or percutaneous intervention based on the disease pattern and severity when they were first developed. Uh, and they were developed with the recognition of, of the difficulty in crossing long complex lesions and the poor durability of these more complex lesions compared to simple task A or B lesions. Um, I'm not sure how many of us really use the task classification to guide therapy at this point. I do think it's still useful in terms of classifying disease severity. However, there's, I think, been a recognition that the technology has advanced. We can treat more complex lesions endovascularly. And the open versus endo decision is, is one that really is predicated on factors other than anatomy or, or factors in addition to lesion anatomy and lesion length, <coughs> such things as age, comorbidity, size of the tissue loss that you're trying to heal, um, those sort of factors. Um, moving on to the types of disease, there's, um, we're going to talk briefly about aorta iliac disease and then, um, and then infrainguinal disease. Um, the, the aorta iliac disease is among the most common side of occlusive disease uh, in the arterial beds. It often coexists with the disease below the inguinal ligament, so generally you're going to have patients with combined um, infrainguinal and supraingual disease. Um, it's important to also note that initial correction of the, of the um, infrainguinal, sorry, supraingual disease can actually um, dramatically affect the patient's um, um, symptoms. So clodicans, for example, even clodicans who present with, with calf pain, if they have aorta iliac disease, just fi fixing that aorta iliac level can often fix the, clo the claudication in the calf as well, depending again on the severity of inf infrainguinal disease and the, um, the degree of symptoms they have and how disabling they are. We generally see three patterns of aortic iliac occlusive disease that are shown here, and I'll go over this in a little more detail. Um, isolated aortic bifurcation disease or, or proximal common iliac disease is the, the least uh, common pattern. This occurs uh, generally in younger patients, typically smokers. There's an, about an equal distribution between males and females in, in this type of um, disease pattern. <clears throat> and um, there's a high likelihood of collateralization, so many of these patients are minimally symptomatic or, or asymptomatic. And rarely does this single-level disease pr produce limb-threatening ischemia. So this is something we're interviewing upon generally for thigh or buttock claudication um, in, in patients who are generally younger smokers. And, and this is a, a typical pattern of this. And you can see this is a, a bulky calcific, a likely calcific disease eccentrically located within the lumen, which is a somewhat difficult pattern to treat with endovascular therapy. Um, the second pattern that, that I'll, I'll mention here is a combined uh, common iliac disease and external iliac disease. So this is basically throughout the iliac circulation, perhaps involving the aorta as well. Um, this has a, a male predominance of th about three to one. And again, the severity of this disease and severity of symptoms depends on the chronicity and how much collateral uh, circulation they've developed. Um, this is another an example of that. For example, you see a common iliac occlusion on the left uh, and common iliac disease on the right with, with pretty small and diseased vessels uh, even beyond that. Um, in the third pattern, this is what we typically will see in most of our patients, um, uh, combined superingual and infrainguinal disease. And um, this is a, a, certainly there's a male preponderance of, of this pattern as well. This is, these are our typical vascular patients with diabetes, uh, coronary disease, et cetera. And these are patients who are likely to have some degree of symptoms, either claudication or, or limb-threatening ischemia. Um, in terms of options for treating aorta il iliac disease, obviously the mon one we're most familiar with is aorta bifemoral bypass. And this is a great operation that's been largely replaced by endovascular therapy. Um, this involves a general anesthesia, obviously, uh, beginning with bilateral groin incisions to identify your targets and do any um, endorectomy and profundoplasty that may be required. Um, the, um, then the uh, retroperitoneal, uh, then the uh, aorta is exposed generally through a midline incision, though it can be done through a retroperitoneal approach as well. Um, through a midline incision, you, expo you expose the uh, transverse colon and omentum, retract that cephalad. The small bowel is eviscerated and displaced up to the right. Um, the left and sigmoid colon are retracted laterally and caudally, and then you uh, incise the, per uh, um, the uh, parietal perine peritoneum overlying the infrarenal aorta to really expose it from the renals on down. Um, retroperitoneal tunnels are made anterior to the common iliac arteries and external iliac arteries, making sure to go below the ureters. Um, they generally will pass uh, something through the, these tunnels made between the groin and, and the, um, the uh, pelvis. And um, the, the, in terms of anastomosis, uh, uh, you can perform either an end to side or uh, end to end to the aortic side. Uh, generally, we do an end to side anastomosis to the femorals, often patching down over the profundus to really uh, improve our profundo flow, and, and this affects our patency of our, our aorta bifem as well. <coughs> 
Um, the general long-term patency of an anaerobic bithermal bypass is, is tremendous. It's, it's well over 75 percent or well over 90 percent a year. Even long-term, 5, 10, 15 years can be uh, upwards of 75 percent. Um, in terms of some technical considerations, uh, grass size is important. You don't want to oversize it too much. You want good, good flow, not a lot of uh, sluggish or stagnant flow within the um, aortic bithermal graft itself. Um, the type of graft is probably, probably not so important. Um, a couple issues on anastomosis. I mentioned both uh, proximal end-to-end -end versus end-to-side. The end-to-end -end anastomosis uh, is advantageous in the sense that it can uh, really help you do a, a complete thromboembolectomy of the, um, uh, of the uh, aorta itself, so you can really get all the disease out circumferentially. Um, it minimizes your embolization risk and possibly re uh, re results in improved hemodynamics and better flow, laminar flow through the graft. Um, and um, it, can, it can be used for aneurysmal disease, uh, complete occlusions, um, bilateral common iliac occlusions. The one situation you don't want to use this, this approach in is if a patient has bilateral external iliac occlusions or heavy disease where they're relying on that inline flow into the pelvis. Um, uh, you don't want to disrupt that with an end-to-end -end anastomosis and then results in absence of perfusion to the pelvis. So those are situations where you certainly would want to do an end-to-side anastomosis proximally, which preserves that pelvic perfusion. Um, the other advantage of an endocyte, it can be less, a little quicker, you can do a little less dissection to do your anastomosis. Um, in terms of complications, these are fairly uh, obvious. There are early complications including renal dysfunction, uh, colon ischemia, um, impotence from the dissection, um, and then compartment syndrome from, from um, which is pretty uncommon for this operation, but from temporary lack of uh, perfusion to the extremities during the operation. Um, late complications can occur, of course, in terms of limb occlusions or graft infection and other, other issues like that. Um, aortic end endorectomy is something that is not relatively common, but it's worth mentioning because it can be a great operation for focal disease. Um, this is an example of some uh, patient I treated, focal disease right at the um, paravisceral aorta. Um, and the, the operation for this, as long as it's limited to this one segment, um, which often involves the ostium of, these, of the renal and mesenteric vessels, um, but the, the operation is demonstrated here. Um, this is the supraceliac aorta, the celiac trunk and SMA, the renal's down here. You basically bring the, the uh, left renal, this is approached to a retroperitoneal incision, bring the left renal uh, artery, uh, left kidney anteriorly. Um, you do a longitudinal incision in the posterior aspect of the aorta here. This shows this big bulky calcific plaque that's being taken out and blocked, um, making sure to get into the ostiums of each of these uh, vessels to, to remove all the disease from there. And then it's closed uh, with a, a simple proline uh, suture um, in a running continuous fashion. Um, aorta iliac endorectomy, um, uh, let me just jump back and say that the primary patency for these operations is, is great over 80 percent long term. So these are good operations as long as the disease is limited. On the other hand, aorta iliac endorectomy is, is less, uh, is some, somewhat of a less common operation because the results are not quite as good. Certainly the, the results of this is, are not as high as aorta bifemoral bypass or even um, uh, aortofemoral bypass. Um, so this is not as common of an operation, although it can be useful in some settings. Done either through a midline or oblique retroperitoneal incision, um, you can perform an endorectomy into the hypogastric artery as, oops, as demonstrated uh, with this plaque that's removed here. The advantage of this operation is there's no prosthetic involved. Um, uh, and uh, the disadvantage, again, is it's not very effective for external iliac disease. It's not an artery that's amenable really to endorectomy, um, and the, in, the patency is inferior to other uh, operations. Uh, iliofemoral bypass, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to skip through this kind of quickly, but iliofemoral bypass is a, a good operation um, generally for external iliac disease. It can be done through a relatively limited uh, retroperitoneal incision or a groin and retroperitoneal incision. <clears throat> Um, uh, fem fem bypass is good for those patients who are poor risk. Uh, can be done even under local or, or epidural or spinal anesthesia. Um, it can be done through two small groin incisions to expose the common femoral artery. In this way, you bring in blood from one iliac circulation to the contralateral leg without doing an abdominal operation. Um, the downside of this, of course, is the graft patency is, is uh, depending on the series, uh, roughly 50 to 60, 70 percent. So it's, it's rare. In, in my eyes, at least, to see an, a long-term patency of 80 percent in, these, in this uh, disease pattern. Um, axial bifemoral bypass, again, is something that's good for high-risk patients who you don't think will um, tolerate an aortic cross-clamp very well, or patients who have reasons you don't want to go into their belly to treat their aortic disease. Um, the important things to note about uh, aorta bifemoral bypass is uh, bifemoral bypass is a, a much better patency than unifemoral bypass. So generally, when we do these, we do aorta bifemoral bypass and axfem and then a femfem graft. Um, 
Moving on, common femoral endoarterectomy and profundoplasty is a great operation. It's very hard for percutaneous intervention to match the results of a, a limited groin incision, uh, which can also be done under local anesthesia. Um, this pattern of disease is, is, is amenable, is, is common in both claudications and CLI patients. Um, the, the, high, the primary patency rate is greater than 80% at, at three to five years. So again, this is a, a good operation in general. Um, this is an example of this, ex exposing the common femoral profund SFA. Um, doing an incision, taking out the, the plaque, which also come, often comes out in one big piece, and then uh, closing it with a patch angioplasty, generally extended down onto the profunda. Um, in terms of fempop, femtib, and fempedal bypass, there are a few basic principles to these. I'm not going to go over this, these operations in too much detail because these are the ones we're still more um, familiar with. But I'd say few, if any, patients are not surgical candidates. You often hear that a patient's not a surgical candidate. This is almost never true. All patients have some <laughs> bypass option, uh, despite the fact that many of these bypass options aren't ideal. Um, the general principles involves bypassing all disease, go from healthy artery to healthy artery, so good inflow, appropriate distal target. <coughs> Uh, I, ideal conduit is the greater saphenous vein, um, uh, at least a 3.5 millimeter diameter. Alternative conduits such as spliced arm vein, PTFP, cryopreserved uh, options um, are okay, but they certainly show less patency. They're more susceptible to infection and it can be unpredictable in terms of graft loss in terms of uh, you have a, a patent fempop graft that will go down acutely despite any, any issues you see in surveillance. Um, endoscopic vein harvest and experienced hands can have equal patency with, with minimal mor morbidity to it. And in situ also can limit your morbidity, bit morbidity and have equal um, results of, of, um, uh, in terms of patency. Um, in general, the patency numbers you should remember for these um, operations are listed here. This is from a Rutherford uh, um, textbook. Essentially, greater saphenous vein has a primary patency rate of greater than 80 percent at one year, um, even up to 70 to 80 percent at five years. So greater saphenous vein above the knee and below the knee is, is very good even at long term. And, and this is the benchmark that we have to compare all these interventions that Rabi talked about earlier. Um, this is the gold standard in terms of patency rates. Um, in terms of PTFE, PTFE has pretty much equal patency rates above the knee uh, as um, uh, saphenous vein. Um, below the knee, this tapers off. And, and the numbers listed here are before uh, propatin was widely used, the heparin bonded um, PTFE graphs, uh, and certainly those have improved our results below the knee to some degree. But the generally accepted um, primary patency below the knee drops off to about 60 percent a year and, and much lower than that uh, long term. Um, the other disadvantage of PTFE is that when these go down, they tend to take out some of the artery with it, uh, which is, does not seem to be the case with our percutaneous interventions or with a saphenous vein bypass. In terms of femtibial bypass, um, uh, patents, primary patency can be between 50 to 75 percent at five years. Um, but importantly, the limb salvage rate in these patients with uh, uh, femtib or femtibial bypasses is greater than, greater than 70 percent at, at five years. So this is a good operation for patients with extensive disease. Um, I'll skip through this other than to say that we ought to have to we have to focus on risk factor modification in all of these patients. That's probably the first thing we should do before offering offering operations. And then in terms of graft surveillance, uh, you know the, the standard surveillance for open um, fem um, uh, fem pop or fem distal grafts with uh, saphenous vein is once yearly. And if you detect stenoses or issues with the graft, uh, you can often intervene upon these either with percutaneous intervention or open surgery to minimize the chance of graft loss. This is not as feasible with PTFE grafts. I've found so. That's it. Thank you.